Gracefully adrift upon a sprawling sea of clouds, this lone island is nearly bursting at the seams with life. Like a shimmering jewel in the sunlight, Skyloft's blinding brilliance is truly something to be admired. This little terrarium is home to a variety of rich cultures, valorous knights, and timeless secrets. An ecosystem as diverse yet jam-packed as this one deserves a much closer inspection, and to my surprise, what I have found while studying the citizens of Skyloft is truly fascinating. I cannot wait to show you what I have learned from observing the day-to-day -day lives of these wonderful people, especially what I found out about Link. You definitely don't want to miss this one. So please, stick around until the end, make yourself comfy, sit back, relax, and let's get started. After awakening from your nap, in the most peaceful of ways imaginable, you take your very first step into the endlessly open blue skies and find yourself just outside of the Knight's Academy in Skyloft. Except we have to go right back in there because there's some pretty cool things in there actually. Whoops! Now that we're back inside, we can interact with several of Link's classmates and instructors. Right away, we enter the kitchen and find Henya, the Academy's esteemed chef. Henya has been serving hot meals for the students at the Knights Training Academy for the last 25 years. Coincidentally, Skyloft just so happens to be preparing for its 25th annual wing ceremony, which heavily implies that the Knights Training Academy was built 25 years ago and Henya was among the very first group of people to ever work there. Besides her incredible dedication to the students, there's something else about Henya that would most likely go completely unnoticed by the majority of players. Taking a closer look at her, we can see a peculiar design etched into her apron. This double wing design is actually one of Henya's family crests. You probably noticed that I said one of, and you heard that right. There's some Skyloftians that actually have more than one crest, but it's entirely dependent upon the individual's unique circumstance and occupation, whether or not they have more than one. In order to fully explain how this system works, let's turn our attention to the wall by the fireplace. On this wall, we'll find Henya's real family crest which resembles a chicken or a rooster. The crest that she wears on her apron is actually her occupational crest. Allow me to explain how I came up to this conclusion. Henya is married to Rusta, who we can typically find hanging out in the Lumpy Pumpkin. Rusta is also seen wearing the same double-winged crest that Henya wears on her apron, establishing a family-wide association with Henya's occupation. The names Henya and Rusta were derived from hen and rooster, which upon reflection now makes sense why their real family crest resembles one. It often seems that this secondary occupational crest takes visual priority over their actual family crest, but this isn't always the case. There's one potential exception to this rule, and that's the resident repairman, Jackamar. Jackamar is Skyloft's eccentric custodian who is tasked with building and repairing the many structures found throughout the island. Even though his work falls under the construction umbrella, he and his wife still wear their original family crest on their clothing. Jackamar's family crest might be representing both his trade and his heritage at the same time, because if we take another look inside the kitchen of the Knight's Training Academy on the fireplace, we can find Jackamar's family crest. This indicates that Jackamar, or perhaps another family member of his, was responsible for the construction of the academy and left their family's trademark on the fireplace to signify their work. It seems family crests can serve as dual-purpose insignias that represent the family in more than one way, but, like I mentioned earlier, this family is the exception to the more commonly practiced traditions. There is a sun above the entrance to Jackamar's home. Inside, we can find another sun engraved into their fireplace. Their bed also has a cloud pattern on it, with little stars, suns, and moons decorating the area around it. The building was even designed to have two sunroofs. Most of the time, crests can tell you a lot about a family and their traits or personalities. This family's smiling sun crest was potentially derived from the rosy cheeks and smiling facial features of Jagamar's beaming wife, Rena, and their mischievous daughter, Kukil. It's difficult to say if this sun symbol really is their secondary, primary, or if it's even their family crest at all, but the interiors of homes can usually tell us a lot about the citizens who inhabit them. For example, when we visit Pip house, a fellow student at the academy and senior to Link, we come across a disturbing sight. An overly filthy home that's in a borderline unlivable state. The reason why it's in this condition is because Pippet's mother, Malara, simply doesn't like doing any chores, even though she does prefer to have a clean home. 
She's a very carefree individual who just waits for problems to solve themselves, such as waiting for strong breezes to blow all the dust away in her home, rather than fixing the problems herself. She'll even offer to pay Link to clean her house for her, which angers Pippet because that money she's paying Link was given to her so that she could buy bread. This indicates to me that Pippet's household is somewhat dysfunctional and there are some tensions within the family. Their family crest reflects this, but it might be difficult at first to see why. After filling in the empty space, you might might begin to recognize a sort of patchwork pattern emerge. This patchwork theme is present on Malara's clothing, their beds, and a few other things. Pippet took up patrolling during the night to earn some extra income in order to provide for his mother, which unfortunately doesn't really work out very well in the end. It just goes to show you that nobody is perfect even in a paradise setting such as Skyloft. However, Skyloft itself, after dark, is far from being a paradise. Once nighttime comes around, monsters start to emerge, such as Choo Choo's and Keys. Rimlets, the normally adorable little cat things during the day, turn into feisty fuzzballs that are now hellbent on giving you a mildly annoying scratch once the moon comes out. The culprit behind this sudden shift from peaceful days into frightful nights is none other than Batru, the friendly neighborhood demon. Hitchhiking on the underbelly of Skyloft, this timid gentleman is nothing but smiles and good vibes. He's completely harmless and is full of remorse at the fact that everyone screams out in terror upon seeing him. He is a demon after all, so that reaction is pretty warranted, but he wants more than anything to put an end to his reclusive lifestyle and make friends with the Skyloftians. He asks you to gather a large enough amount of gratitude crystals, which are rewarded from assisting people with their troubles, in order to turn himself into a human. Before we can help him with this, let's take a moment to observe the sash around his waist. Batru appears to have his very own crest that closely resembles his physical appearance, but is this a family crest? More than likely, this isn't the case, because after we successfully turn him into a human, his crest is very slightly altered. The long horns are shorter than they were before, which now seems to depict his hairstyle. I'm willing to bet that through demonic magics, Batru fashioned his own crest in order to fit in with the other citizens of Skyloft. With enough happiness from the gratitude crystals, he, along with his crest, both underwent the same transformation. Not only was Batru changed, Skyloft after dark was as well. It turns out that Batru's very presence on the island was enough to manipulate his surroundings, turning it into a hostile environment. But thanks to our efforts, Batru as well as the rest of Skyloft can now roam the island at night without a care in the world. Now we can find a forever grateful Batru enjoying the hustle and bustle of the bazaar during the day. While we're on the subject of the bazaar, you might have noticed the red and blue banners flying just outside of the bazaar. These two crests don't actually belong to any one person in the entire game. Instead of belonging to a family, I believe these two crests belong to two groups. In order for the bazaar to function, the flow of supplies, merchandise, and food would need to be able to be imported and exported through trustworthy sponsors. These operations would need proper funding and backing, which is why I think the two crests flying outside of the bazaar belong to two sponsor groups working together to make the bazaar a reality. Regardless, the wonderful people doing business inside the bazaar have crests of their own, such as the two patrons sitting at Piper's food court. Rue loves to talk about how his grandson is a rescue knight, but he never tells us what his name is. Thankfully, with the help of concept art and being saved personally by all of the members of the rescue knight team, Hawk, Albert, and Kai it's revealed that Kite, the knight in green, turns out to be his grandson. Piper herself is always hard at work, pretty much never leaving the massive pot of soup she is cooking, so it's difficult to see her family crest in-game. But, thankfully, the internet is a wonderful thing. Now that we can see her crest, we can confirm that she and her son, Gully, do indeed share the same crest. The cooking pot or goblet design on her head wrap is most likely her occupational crest. Gondo and his mother, Greba, both share the same mechanic-themed crest, since it has been a family business for several generations. Gondo never stops working, even after dark, so half of his home was turned into a workshop, much to his mother's displeasure. The item check girl, Beatrice, has several different designs of a keyhole for a crest, since her job is to lock away people's belongings for them in safekeeping, but her father, Peter, shows us what her family crest actually looks like, which he proudly wears on his arm. Spare it the fortune teller, upon first inspection, it might be difficult to discern what his crests actually are, but if we look carefully, the brute he is wearing depicts an eye, which I believe to be his occupational crest. If we visit him after hours, it becomes much easier to tell what his family crest really is, which turns out to be these little flag-like designs. This design is also seen in several places throughout his home. Love, Birdie, and their newborn daughter all run the 
potion shop together as a family business, so of course all three of them wear the same bottle-shaped crest. You heard that right, even the bundle of joy herself wears this design on her bib, but it's only visible in her finalized concept art. Their home very much feels like an alchemist's home, with bottles, grinders, distilleries, and ingredients strewn about with their occupational crest being found on their beds, as well as their fireplace. Last but not least, we have Rupin, who runs the gear shop, and his mother, Gazelle. Their family crest is worn on their backs, while their occupational crest is a rupee. This duo does not hold back their love for money, which is plain to see in their lavishly decorated household. Rupee designs are found absolutely everywhere, and don't even think about sitting on that couch or breaking anything. <laughs> Back outside and into the sunlight, we have a few more interesting crests to talk about before I reveal the most fascinating crest of them all. So let's head on down and talk to Oriel and her older brother, Pero. Even though these two are siblings, their family crests are actually completely different for some reason. Perhaps once you become old enough and you live on your own, you're able to acquire your very own crest that's unique to you as an independent individual. Let me know what you think is going on here down in the comments. The owners of the Lumpy Pumpkin, Pum and his daughter Kina, of course have a pumpkin as their crest crest, and it's pretty obvious why that's the case. Keat, a regular patron of the Lumpy Pumpkin, has a fairly unique family crest that almost looks like it depicts the sky tails found inside the Thunderhead Cloud Dome. Beetle, the lean mean pedaling machine, has, to absolutely no one's surprise, a beetle as his crest. Who would have guessed? Aegis, the Knight Commander, is so proud of his occupation that he wears his crest in not one, not two, but three separate locations on his outfit. Instructor Horwell is extremely knowledgeable when it comes to animals, so he is often looking after Headmaster Kippora's pet Rimlet, Mia. As such, he has a very fitting and somewhat humorous crest. Instructor Owlin is a master botanist. His vast knowledge of plant life and obsession with collecting every known species has earned him an equally fitting crest. Even Dodo, the colorful gentleman who runs the minigame on Fun Fun Island, has his own family crest. There's even more crests out there to be seen, such as Carinae's, Fledges, Collins, and Stritches, which are all completely unique to them. But what I believe you're probably going to be the most curious about are the crests that belong to Groose, Zelda, and Link. Groose does indeed have his very own family crest, but there's honestly not much else to mention about it other than the simple fact that he has one. If Groose actually was responsible for starting the Gerudo bloodline, it would have been pretty cool if there were some sort of hint to that in his family crest design, but alas, it was not meant to be. The head shape and name of the Gerudo dragonfly is the only known potential source behind the creation of the famous Gerudo symbol, which suggests that Groose eventually settled and built his own kingdom in the Lanera region. Zelda and Gapora, her father, wear the same crest, which is a slightly different version of the goddess Hylia's, which is prominently on display on the door leading into the goddess statue. In fact, Zelda's family crest is even spotted on the pillars inside the goddess statue and even in the sealed temple, better known in ancient times as the Temple of Hylia. Does this mean that Zelda's ancestors were actually one of the closest groups of people to Hylia in her prime? Zelda's heritage might even be traceable directly back to the original Seven Sages. Her ancestors might have been the ones responsible for building the Temple of Hylia in the first place. Now that's an exciting discovery. But there's just one more discovery to be made that I think is genuinely the most incredible of them all. Link's Family Crest. <gasps> Link, as a character, has always been known to be a complete blank slate. Well, I think it goes without saying at this point that we all know Link is more important to the story of the Zelda franchise than it initially seems. In fact, after making this discovery, he is above and beyond far more important now than he's ever been before. Link's lineage can actually be traced all the way back to the ancient era of Hylia herself, just like Zelda's ancestors. Much like Zelda, Hylia had her own chosen knight during that time period, which most of us seasoned Zelda veterans will already be familiar with. But how can we explore this information further through in-game means? First, let's begin by taking a look at Link's family crest. His belt makes it a little bit difficult to make out what it's supposed to be, but I have other methods of getting a better look at it. Now that we can fully appreciate the design of Link's crest, you may have already realized what it is. It's none other than Link's very own Crimson Loftwing. 
You can clearly make out the head, body, and feet of the bird, while the large swirl coming off the back of it is supposed to be the tail. A slightly obscure fact about Link's Loftwing is that the tail of his bird actually curls up and rests on the bird's back while it's not in flight. This is even mentioned by the developers as being an exclusive trait to both Link and Zelda's Loftwing in their concept artwork. There isn't a single Loftwing in the entire game that shares this trait, which suggests to me that these two birds are incredibly unique. It's mentioned by Gipora that Link's Crimson Loftwing was thought to have been nearly extinct due to how unbelievably rare it was to have ever seen one. Maybe the same thing was also said about Zelda's Loftwing. The significance behind Link's family crest being his Crimson Loftwing goes much, much deeper. The Hylian Shield, an indestructible legendary treasure that has been kept in the possession of Lanayru the Thunder Dragon, has a red bird crest engraved into it. It has been confirmed from multiple sources that this crest is 100% representative of Link's Crimson Loftwing, but how is that possible? I think it's about time that I reveal the full truth of Link's origins and just how important he really is. The only other known instance of this crest existing elsewhere in Skyward Sword is in the Temple of Time, behind one of the two time gates. Why would this crest be here of all places? Well, that's because the Lanera region used to be under the protection of Hylia's Chosen Knight the very first incarnation of Link. The Crimson Loftwing Crest on the Hylian Shield and the one found in the Temple of Time belonged to the original Link. I mean, think about it like this for a second. Why else would the Thunder Dragon be in possession of the Hylian Shield in the first place? Why would he be so fascinated with testing one's abilities and courage through trials? Come to think of it, why are there claw shot points scattered literally everywhere throughout the Lanera region in the first place? The claw shot is a sacred tool only obtained through the completion of the Silent Realm found in the Lanera region, which is only accessible through Link's mind. Every item received through the Silent Realm trials must have belonged to the original Link. Thanks to the fact that there are far more claw shot locations found in this region, we can determine that this place used to be the most highly trafficked area by the original Link. It's almost like the region itself was used as some sort of training grounds, or it was specifically designed this way so that only the original Link, the sole wielder of the claw shot, would be able to traverse this region region and reach areas normally inaccessible to anyone else. Have you ever wondered why the ancient robot statues in this long hallway were saluting? This is a secret back entrance to the Temple of Time, so they're definitely saluting someone of high status, which would either be Hylia herself or her chosen knight. The fact that the Crimson Loftwing Crest is prominently on display in the Temple of Time leads me to believe that the person they were meant to be saluting was none other than the original Link. Now let me ask you this, who else would Hylia trust to safeguard the second time gate? A time gate that is so unbelievably far away from the Faron region where its counterpart lies. A time gate that would otherwise remain vulnerable to abuse unless protected by someone skilled and trusted enough to keep it safe. The first Link, Hylia's chosen knight, was an incredibly well respected and highly esteemed man who was given control over an entire region. I mean come on, the Temple of Time and Link go hand in hand at this point. The Temple of Time might as well be Link's temple. I wouldn't even be surprised if he was the one responsible for building it himself. I mean, just look at the way it was designed for crying out loud. This time gate was more than likely built to be a diversion in case anyone ever planned on abusing it. This time gate and the temple surrounding it was specifically built to catch eyes and lure evil towards it. There's no roof at all and it's extremely exposed on all sides, but this was intentional. Hylia's chosen knight could easily swoop in on a loft wing, a crimson one at that, and gain immediate access to the time gate to defend it if need be. There's an obviously designed choke point at the small bridge leading up to the gate with a giant fatal drop below which would make defending against any invaders approaching on foot much easier to manage. When the front gate is closed, the only other way to reach this time gate on foot has a defense mechanism built into it that seals away the entrance by hiding it underground. Girahim had absolutely no idea that a second time gate even existed at first, which really does suggest that the one in this region was built only to be a scapegoat, since the time gate in the Temple of Hylia was always going to remain perfectly safe under the protection of the Seven Sages, Zelda's ancestors, the Sheikah, and perhaps even Hylia herself. What better place to send Hylia's chosen knight than to the other time gate? The incredible legacy and all that remains of this legendary hero is plain to see throughout the Lanera region. If only you knew where to find them. And now we know the full story behind Link and his family crest.
Well, what did you think? Was my theory spot on? Or was it so bad that you're contemplating tracking me down and hitting me over the head with a golf club? Alright kid, open the door. I know you're in there. I got something for you. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. Really quick before I go, I wanted to thank my YouTube members for all of your dedication and patience. All of you are the absolute best. If you aren't already, please consider becoming a member and supporting the channel. I would very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed yourself, there is much more to come in the future, so please subscribe and stick around for another onslaught of Zelda lore from Gossip Geist.